Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, a breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Listen, fellows and girls, it looks from here as though the Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice great new offer is going to be a record breaker. And no wonder, there's never been anything quite like it. Just imagine, the swell tasting breakfast cereal shot from guns are offering you an official challenge of the Yukon flashing signal light. This brand new pocket sized signal light is an amazing invention made specially for you listeners. It's a special kind of flashlight that works two ways. That is, this signal light sends out beams of red light or beams of green light. Yes, with a flick of your finger, it flashes red or it flashes green. Say, there's nothing like this mystifying two-way signal light for sending secret codes and messages, for signaling your friends, for fun. Whatever you do, listen to how you get yours. I'll tell you in just a few minutes. Nearly everyone in Dawson had heard of Trigger Bill Desmond, the sharpshooting star of the All-American Wild West shows. But when Big Ben Diamond brought him to the Yukon to be the featured attraction at the music hall, the sourdoughs were more than a little surprised at his appearance. He was short even in cowboy boots. He was slight. He was 26, but he seemed to be about 19. He had light, curly hair, blue eyes, and was extremely polite to everyone he met. Oh, that's the best shot in the United States, huh? Don't look like a bad man to me. He's nothing but a kid. I wonder if he can shoot. We'll find out about that tomorrow night. Maybe he uses a slingshot. (laughs) Big Ben, hard and ruthless, disliked the kid from the first moment he saw him. But Trigger Bill could shoot. And at the finish of his act, when he blazed away with both guns and the target bell rang out a rapid-fire tribute to his accuracy, the music hall audience rose to its feet and cheered. Even Ben gave his grudging approval. Hey, kid, come here. Yes, sir. No, kid, I was all set to give you a notice. Didn't you like the act, sir? I changed my mind. You're not much to look at. If those clay pipes and targets could talk... You'd probably be afraid to shoot at him. That depends, sir. I was in Cuba with Colonel Roosevelt's Rough Riders. <laughs> the mascot of the troop, huh? Well, as I say, I've changed my mind. The crowd likes you, and I won't break our contract. But keep away from here when you're not working. You might get into trouble. Yes, sir. Yes, the kid was a popular attraction at the music hall. But it was a mistake for him to ask Sally O'Neill to help him with his act. It was early one morning in the deserted cafe that Big Ben roared his disappointment. Well, listen, Sprout. I'm the one who does the hiring around here, and I hire Sally to dance. She offered to help, sir. I certainly did, Ben, and I'm going to. Is that so? You heard me, Ben. Just don't forget you're my girl. Twenty-three skidoo. I'm giving you fair warning, Willie. Don't get any fancy ideas. Kid, why did you let him call you Willie? Well, it's... It's my name, sort of. He didn't mean it as any compliment. I know, but I don't like trouble. Seems to me I'm always getting into it, so I try not to rile people. And so they use you for a doormat. Well, get this straight. I'm not Ben's girl. I don't like his style. But I don't like any man who doesn't have some gumption. I'm sorry. Never mind. Let's get on with the rehearsal. Now, what do I do? Hold out one of those clay pipes to start with. And I'll, uh, I'll stand over here. 
Like this? Yeah. Uh, hold it a little farther away till you get used to it. Well, all right. Shoot. Hmm. A kid, do you ever miss? <laughs> well, no. Then you listen to me. You're going to stand up for your rights a little more around here. By the way you can shoot, you don't have to take any back talk from any man. I can't bluff anybody, Sally. People just seem to know I wouldn't use a gun on anything but a target. Not unless somebody drew first. And people don't even carry guns in Dawson. Some of them do. And I think you better be one of them. I can't. I just don't understand you. I'm, I'm sorry. If only you had a little of my temper. It wouldn't be fair for me to get into a gunfight. I can draw faster and shoot straighter than any man I ever met. The other fellow wouldn't have a chance. Maybe I'm wrong. What? You couldn't be wrong about anything. Yes, I am. The only trouble with you is that you're a nice guy. And I wouldn't want that to be changed. But nobody's going to take advantage of you around here because of that. And I'm going to make it my business to see that they don't. Now, come on. Let's get on with the rehearsal. With Sally helping with the act, it became even more popular. And the men of Dawson learned to like the kid. He had no trouble with Ben because the big man was spending most of the time at his mine in Rainbow Creek. There was talk of a feud between him and Mike Lonigan, who owned the property next to him. Mike's gone to the police. Why? What's happened? He accuses Ben's men of robbing the sluices. They say Sergeant Preston's investigating it. Well, if Ben and Mike tangle, there's going to be fireworks. The fireworks came, and they started one evening at the music hall. The kids stopped at a table where Sally was sitting with some of the other girls. It's about time for us to go on, Sally. I'm ready, kid. As Sally rose from her chair, Brad Kramer, late of the San Francisco underworld and now a notorious <coughs> Dawson troublemaker, walked up to her. Hey, where do you think you're going? It's time for the kids' act. You're not going anywhere until you dance with me. Out of the way, Brad. I said you were going to dance with me. And I'm telling you, there won't be any more music until after the kids' exhibition. You leave the band to me. Take your hands off me. <laughs> you heard the lady. Take your hands off her. Well, well. If it isn't Junior, I suppose you're going to make me. Yes, I am. Without a gun, you haven't got a chance. I'll show you. <laughs> Why, you little squirt, I'll break you in two. Fred roared with rage as the kid's right caught him flush on the jaw, and he lashed back at him. But the kid dodged the blow and stepped in with a right and a left to the face. The kid was fast, but it was an unequal fight from the beginning. Brad outweighed him by at least 50 pounds, and it was obvious to everyone that the first of his blows that landed solidly would mean the end for the kid. It came at last, and the kid was knocked off his feet and into a table. He hit hard and slumped to the floor. Brad started toward him. Don't you dare kick him, you big bully. Out of my way, Brad. Well, hello, Ben. Your hired help got smart with me. I've just been putting him in his place. That's good enough. Walk back to my office with me. Sure. I I came here to see you, Ben. Come on. You too, Dirk. Right with you, boss. Kid, you're all right, aren't you? Sure. I just cracked my head a little. Ben led the way to his office backstage. Once inside, he motioned to a chair for Brad and signaled to Dirk to close the door. Uh, what's on your mind, Brad? Well, I... I've got me a new job. A new one? <laughs> It's your first, isn't it? <laughs> I've handled this kind of work before. You're working for Mike Lonigan, huh? That's right. Perhaps you ought to know that Mike's digging gravel on my property. I know that's what you claim. But Mike's got the law on his side. And he's also got me. So that's it. That's it. From now on, you're going to leave his sluices and his equipment alone. I've guaranteed, Mike, that you would. Huh? What's that? Don't be so nervous. It's only the kid starting his exhibition. Did I hear you right? You guaranteed, Mike, that I'd leave him alone? Yeah. Because I knew that all I'd have to do was ask... What gave you that idea? Uh, maybe you better ask Dirk to step outside for a minute. No, he stays. He knows all my business. All of it? Yeah. Okay. Then he knows who killed Maxie Lake back in Frisco. Hey, what's that? Easy, Ben. Nobody's going to spill a word of it as long as you leave Mike alone. Is that understood? Think it over for a minute. 
I've watched the kid shoot for a while. Say, I'm glad he didn't have a gun when I tangled with him. I never saw shooting like this in my life. Close the door, Brad. Uh, sure. So you thought it... No, no, Ben, put down that gun! Before Ben could fire, Brad threw himself across the room and grabbed Ben's gun arm. The two men fought for the gun. Brad fell to the floor. Fifteen minutes later, as the kid came off the stage, Dirk called him over to the open back door of the building. Hey, kid! Bring your rifle over here. What's the matter? Nothing. But you do all your shooting at short range on the stage. I want to see what you can do at a distance with a rifle. Name the target, Dirk. I've hung a lantern down there on the waterfront. Can you see it? Uh, sure. Well, let's see you put it out. All right. Good work. Anything to oblige. Hey, I didn't notice those people out on the dock. Suppose they thought I was shooting at them? Nah, they're just some of the boys I sent down there to watch the shot. Oh. You're all right, kid. Thanks, Dirk. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door at the headquarters of the Northwest Mounted Police. Sergeant Preston was on duty, and the great dog King was lying beside his master's desk. Come in, the door's unlocked. Sergeant, you must come with me quick. What's the matter, Hans? A man's been shot. He's dead. Just a second while I get my parker. Who is it? Brad Kramer. What did happen? Music hall? No, he was not there, but that's where the shot came from. Let's go. Come on, King. <laughs> Tell me about it, Hans. Well, I was down by the waterfront getting ready to fish through the ice. Yes? I see Brad Kramer come walking along. Oh, uh, first there's something that you should know. Tonight, Brad had a fight at the music hall with the kid. It's about that girl, Sally. What's that have to do with the shooting? Well, Brad knocked the kid down. He hit him very hard. What about the shooting? Well, it's because of the fight that I think it happened. I see the kid in the doorway of the music hall. Brad is near the dock, 200 yards away. The kid has a rifle. He raises it and shoots. Are you saying that Bill Desmond shot Brad Kramer? That's right, Sergeant. It is murder. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Fellas and girls, don't wait another day. Hurry, send for your official Challenge of the Yukon secret two-way signal light. It's new, it's different, it's terrific. This mystifying flashing signal light is like a special kind of flashlight, a super special kind. It's so unusual, you've probably never heard of anything quite like it. This amazing signal light works two ways. That is, it sends out beams of red light or beams of green light. It actually flashes either red or green. And it works with a simple flick of your finger. Imagine owning this amazing invention, made specially for flashing your own codes and messages to your particular friends. It works much like blinker signal guns used by the Army and Navy. Yes, this signal light has a special plastic directional signal barrel. That's to prevent others from detecting your secret signal flashes, except the person at whom they're aimed. And you can carry this handy two-way signal signal light anywhere you go without anyone detecting its presence. That's because it's pocket size, less than four inches long. It fits snugly in your pocket without anyone being the wiser. Talk about exciting. Say, you can make up secret codes and messages to signal friends. For instance, two red flashes might mean danger, stay back. Or one green flash and one red flash might mean help. Come at once. Say, your new official challenge of the Yukon signal light is the real McCoy. It's mystifying. It's a beauty. Its color is glistening shiny black, and it has Sergeant Preston's name in his own handwriting across the side. Important, too, it comes complete with standard replaceable electric bulb and battery. Send for yours today. Send now for your secret signal light that flashes red, that flashes green. Just send 25 cents in coin. That's all. Just 25 cents and one box top from a package of delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Print your name and address and send at once to Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. This official two-way signal light is not on sale in stores anywhere. This exclusive offer is made to introduce new friends to the swell-tasting breakfast cereals shot from guns. Ask Mother to serve delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. You'll love it. And remember, to get your mystifying two-way signal light, Send 25 cents and the top from the package. Mail to Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. I'll repeat, that's Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. (laughs) 
Now to continue our story. Half an hour after Hans had brought the news of the murder to Sergeant Preston, Dirk entered Big Ben's office at the music hall. Boss, things aren't working out the way you thought they would. Why not? Well, the boys all did their part. They said they saw the kid shoot Brad. Wasn't that enough for Preston? I don't know. He examined the body and had it taken down to headquarters. Now he's out in the cafe. He's come to arrest the kid. He's sure taking his time about it. The kid and Sally are sitting at a table over in the corner. He hasn't even gone near them. He's asking everybody about the fight. He has to get all the facts. Has he questioned you yet? About what? Uh, The kid must have told him that you asked him to shoot at a lantern. He hasn't even talked to the kid. I can't figure it out. Maybe that's the sergeant now. Come in. Well, hello, sergeant. Good evening, Ben. Won't you have a chair? Thanks. (laughs) Duncan. You know, this is sad business. Larry. I feel that I'm partly to blame. Do you? Well, I'm the one who brought the kid up here. I didn't realize he was dangerous, though. Brad came here to see you tonight, didn't he, Ben? Well, no. He came here to see Sally. That's what the fight was about. It was you who stopped the fight. Yeah. And you took Brad back here. That's right. To keep him away from the kid. No one saw Brad leave the building, Ben. Maybe he didn't go out the front way. There's a back door just around the corner. I guess the kid saw him leave, all right. He must have just finished his act about that time. Yeah, you know, I saw the kid fire the shot, too, Sergeant. He was standing in the open doorway with a rifle in his hand. I saw him raise it, take aim, and shoot. Oh. The distance doesn't mean anything to him. He let Brad get all the way down to the river. No, that isn't the way it happened. What do you mean? On sod, so did Dirk. It's a cold night. The wind bites through unless your parka's well buttoned. What's that got to do with it? Brad's parka was buttoned. Well, sure. You said... I still don't see... There's no bullet hole in it. Eh? No. The parka must have been buttoned after Brad was shot. Well, I suppose... uh, I suppose one of the men who found it. They said they didn't touch the body. Yes, The parka isn't the only evidence in the kid's favor. I saw him shoot. From the back door here with Brad 200 yards away. Yeah? There were powder burns on Brad's clothing. The bullet that killed Brad was fired at close range. Your testimony, Dirk, and the testimony of the others have put the kid in the clear. But he must have... The sergeant's right, Dirk. The kid shot couldn't have killed him. Let's see. Certainly a relief. It's no relief to me, although I'm glad it wasn't the kid. I still have to find the man who did it. Are you sure Brad left the building as soon as he left your office, Ben? Uh, no, not at all. But he must have left the front way. No one saw him. Say, you're not accusing me, are you? Oh, of course not. There's no evidence against anyone yet. Perhaps there won't be until we find the motive for the killing. The kid had a fight with Brad about Sally. I thought Sally was your girl, Ben. Well, she likes the kid. He likes her. Brad tried to make Sally dance with him. If I'd have been there at the time, I'd have taken a poke at him myself. Of course you would. We'll have to look for another motive, but uh, we have a lead, haven't we, King? (coughs) Better start following it up. Come on, boy. Good night, Ben. Good night. Good night, Dirk. Good night. He's a cool customer. Too cool to suit me. But there's no way he can find out. He said he had a lead. If he finds out why Brad came here... He can't. How much does Mike Lonigan know, Dirk? I never thought of him. I've been thinking of nothing else. Yeah. There he came. Follow the sergeant. Okay. I've got a hunch he's going to leave town. Now watch him. If he takes the trail for Rainbow Creek... Well, if he does, get back here fast. It was to Rainbow Creek that the sergeant went that night. The trail was hard-packed, and with King setting the pace, the trip was made in two hours. Mike Lonigan was roused from his sleep. Sergeant Preston! I can't waste any time. Sit down and listen to me, Mike. I sure, Sergeant. What brings you out here? Sit down and listen. Sure, Two weeks ago, your sluice boxes were robbed. You called on the Northwest Mounted Police to investigate. I was assigned to the case, and I not only found the man who committed the robbery, but I arrested him. It was George Tracy. Good work. Now listen. He's in jail, and he's confessed that Ben Diamond hired him to do the job. 
The only reason Ben hasn't been arrested is we have only Tracy's word, and that's not enough to convict him. However, the San Francisco police have been in touch with us concerning Ben, or at least someone whose description fits him. It's possible that Ben will go back to the States to face a murder charge. Uh, Sergeant... Let me finish. You haven't been satisfied with the way the police have been handling your case. You decided to do something about it yourself. You hired Brad Kramer. How do you know that? Brad started talking as soon as he arrived in town. You hired him as protection against Ben. Now, why? Why'd you pick him for the job? Because he said that Ben was afraid of him. Why? Well, he said he had something on him. Yes, that's what I thought. Well, you've lost your protection, Mike. You'll have to be satisfied with the force in the future. Why? What's happened? Brad is dead. Murdered. Ben do it? Must have been either Ben or one of his men. Brad went to the music hall tonight. Got in a fight with Bill Desmond, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. He went there to see Ben, didn't he? Sergeant? You're right about the murder charge in the States. Kramer knew Ben was wanted. He was going to threaten him. He did. And as a result, Ben put a bullet through his heart. The force may not work fast enough to suit you, Mike, but believe me, it isn't safe to take the law into your own hands. No, I was wrong. I know I shouldn't have had anything to do with Brad, but he came to me and he said... Well, that doesn't matter now. I'm going back to Dawson and arrest Ben. There's only circumstantial evidence against him, but at least I can hold him till the officer from the States arrives. Let's go, King. An hour later, Dirk and Hans drove dog teams up to the back entrance of the music hall. Dirk went inside and headed straight for Ben's office. The big man was stuffing gold and currency into a carpet bag. We're all set. Yeah, good. I'll be ready in a minute. You haven't said anything to anybody. Nobody but Hans. You said he could come with us. Yeah, he's a good man with a gun. Yeah, give me a hand with this. It's too heavy for one man to carry. Sure. Well, so you're leaving. What makes you think so? The safe looks mighty empty to me. Take care of it, Dirk. Use your gun butt. Don't. No, I... Oh. What do we do with her? Just leave her here? No. We'll take her with us. I don't like that. It's no business of yours. I'll take her out and put her on one of the sleds. Okay. Take her back here and give me a hand with this bag and hurry it up. Okay. When the sergeant drove up to the music hall, there was an excited crowd out in front. The kid was just about to step on the running board of a sled to which six Labradors were hitched when he saw the Mountie. Okay. Oh, sergeant, sergeant, stay going. Ben? Yeah, Ben and Dirk and Hans, and they've taken Sally with them. There are sled tracks leading from the back of the building here down to the river. They head north. There's Forty mile on the border. You are sure about that? Well, they're gone. The safe's empty. And Dirk and Hans were seen harnessing dog teams and loading their sleds with supplies. That's good enough for me. I'll follow them. I'm sure that Sally didn't go with them willingly. I'm sure of that, too. Ben's realized the game's up. Was he the one? He killed Brad Kramer, and he's wanted for another murder in the States. Oh, can't I come with you? I might be able to help catch him. I'm afraid you wouldn't be able to keep up. On King! On King was working in harness, and he lunged forward at the sergeant's command, down to the river and then north along the Yukon Trail. Faster and faster. A pace that no other team in the territory could match. Mile after mile. One hour. Two hours. And then the sergeant, who was watching the landmarks on the bank closely, shouted a command. Parking! That's it, boy. We're taking the overland trail and cutting off the bend. The cutoff that the sergeant followed saved at least five miles. And when the river was reached once more, there were no fresh sled tracks. The sergeant stopped in the shadow of a large boulder on the bank. Okay. Oh, okay. Make them quiet down, King. A bark from King and the other members of the team dropped in their tracks. Silently, the sergeant waited. An hour passed. The northern lights faded from the sky. The gray dawn dispersed the sharp blue shadow that the boulder had made on the gleaming snow. And then the sergeant saw the men. Ben was driving the first sled and Sally was riding it. Dirk drove the second with Hans as his passenger. The sergeant stepped out on the trail, his rifle ready. Stop in the name of the queen. Don't go for your guns. But the three men paid no attention to the sergeant's command. Dirk and Hans dropped down behind their sled. Ben pulled Sally from the sled so that she acted as a shield. The sergeant was unable to shoot without hitting her. And Ben fired. Oh! The shot hit the sergeant in the leg and knocked him to the ground. His rifle flew from his hand, out of reach, and Ben prepared to shoot again. But King jumped in front of the sergeant, ready to protect his fallen master with his life. Ben thrust Sally aside. All right. the dog and then the rest? The 
sergeant started crawling toward his rifle. And then suddenly, sharply, from a hundred yards up the trail, a rifle spoke. And Ben clutched at his right arm. It was the kid who had fired. He stood in full view, and now he was squeezing the trigger as he aimed at Dirk. But both Dirk and Han shifted their position so that the sled would give them protection from the kid's bullets, and they started firing back at him. The sergeant called the king. Quick, king, the rifle. The great dog ran to pick up the rifle as his master took advantage of the diversion to crawl back to the cover of the boulder. Here, boy. Here. Good work, king. Now, in spite of his wound, the sergeant was ready to take part in the battle once more. The kid was firing from the shelter of his own sled, and his bullets were chipping wood from Dirk and Hans' cover. The sergeant's first shot made them realize they were completely exposed to his fire, and panic seized them. They shouted their surrender. Sally, you all right? Come here, then. It's only my leg. Here, take my rifle and keep them covered. All right. Come on, kid. A few minutes later, the kid had taken charge of the prisoners under the sergeant's supervision. Dirk and Hans wore handcuffs. Will you take care of Ben's arms, Sally? After I take care of you, Sergeant. Ben deserves a lot worse than he got. He'll get what he deserves, don't worry. Why, kid, what's the matter? Your hands are shaking. It's the first time I've ever been nervous with a gun in my hands. Shooting straight counted so much. Sally and King and I are grateful for what you did. But I had to shoot straight seemed to me that every bit of practice I put in during my whole life was just so that I'd be ready for that one moment. You see, I love Sally. I want to marry her. You will. (laughs) Okay. But if the sergeant's grateful to you, you should be grateful to him. If he hadn't been such a good detective, Ben might have sent you to jail. I am grateful, Sergeant. We've made a good team. Now that it's over, I don't mind telling you that King and I have never had a closer call. How about it, boy? Yes, King, I agree. We've been lucky. And I'm just as glad as you are that this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Here's one more chance, fellas and girls. One more chance to send for your mystifying, flashing, two-way signal light. That's the special new invention, like a flashlight, for signaling secret codes and messages to your friends. This amazing signal light works two ways. It flashes red and it flashes green. It's not sold in stores. Supplies are limited, so act fast. Send your name and address, plus 25 cents, and one box top from delicious Quaker Pup wheat or Quaker Pup rice. Mail immediately to Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. I'll repeat, that's Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case Trailmate. When King and I met two men on the trail and joined them as trail mates, I had no idea we were with a couple of bank robbers. When they realized I was becoming suspicious, trouble really started, and I was lucky to come out of that adventure alive. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.